Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Sure can. All right, great. So yes, um, I'm, I'll record this and post it, but, uh, and uh, I'll just do, uh, I, I'm just gonna basically review for the, for the final exam. Um, but if somebody has uh, issues with uh, their uh, project, uh, I will stay on uh, for a little bit after, well, I'll stay on at noon for the, or let's see, 12, 10. Uh, I'll do my, I'm gonna do my logic design class at 11 and then at noon, I'll be back on for a help session. So, um, okay. So let me, I wanna pull up the, pull up a document here and then I will get started. Oh, let's see, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so so we have today and we have Wednesday and that's it for the semester and um, hard to believe. And let's see if I can pull this up. Hmm. Okay, so I've kind of been through some of these before and uh, I'm gonna do, give me one more second here, sorry. Probably should have had this ready to go. But I didn't. All right. Okay, so um, so the test is going to be most, pretty much multiple choice, uh, or you know, short answer completions, like the quizzes that we've had. In fact, I, I may use some of the quiz questions. Um, the I'll, I'll probably put um, between fifty and hundred questions on the test. Let's see. Uh, yeah, something like. Uh, Yeah, so yeah, probably probably 75 at least, something like that. And um, you'll have two hours to work on it. Uh, it's gonna cover, it's gonna cover uh, things like why we use language-based tools, um, the uh, Vivado uh, uh, IDE, um, and then just uh, uh, some concepts about uh, doing hardware design by using language-based tools, the difference between uh, uh, things that are synthesizable and things that aren't. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the simulations, test benches, um, and then um, a little bit about some of the details of Avado, like you know how we instantiate a module and, and uh, dot notation versus named notation parameters. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about blocking and non-blocking and always blocks, uh, the difference between continuous assignment statements and always blocks. Um, a little, little bit about the Nexus 4 board and uh, some questions about some of the labs. Um, and uh, yeah, I, that, probably that. I think that's pretty much it. So, so let me go through some of that. Um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna probably what I'll do is show my show my screen here, and uh, maybe I'll make this bigger so it's easy to see. So these are example type questions. This is from 2018. Okay, so let me share that screen, and I think. Let me just real quick. Uh, all right, that should be good. OK. 
Okay. So I assume everybody can see that. And then I'm going to, yeah, that's good. And then see who else might be, if anybody else needs to be, yeah, there is somebody else that needs to get in. Okay. And then, good. So I'll keep an eye on that. Seven. All right. And then I never figured out. Oh, maybe like this. Oh, okay. All right. Something like that. Okay. So, seven. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> the... Um, yeah, and I don't know why I can't... Uh, Yeah. All right. Well, anyway. Okay. So um, language based hardware design tools have a number of advantages. And so, so the gate level detail uh, for a large FBA would be overwhelming. That's why we use HDL. So true or false. Obviously true. Uh, in fact, uh, I think I did in one of the videos, I talked about the size that the paper would have to be if you did a uh, if you did a schematic that included uh, 2 billion or 4 billion transistors from the latest NVIDIA uh, graphics card, the chip on that card has, I think it's 2 billion, but I, I, I did the calculations on 4 billion. So maybe that's what it was. I can't remember for sure, but uh, 2 billion transistors. And if you uh, laid out a piece of paper and each transistor had a square inch of schematic space it would take you a one square mile of paper to do that schematic. When you think about that, the, how likely it would be that you could get that right or that you could ever make sense with that, you realize that that's just crazy. Uh, really no possibility that you could ever do that. Uh, I mean, it's just, just not possible. So uh, you can see from that, that there's just no way uh, that we could possibly do some of the chips that are being done now without these language-based tools. And in addition to that, uh, it allows us to, to reuse uh, intellectual property that's gone before. That's question three, language-based tools make it easier to integrate third-party IP into a design. Yes, that's true. Uh, number two, these tools allow design at behavior level. Thus, many different algorithms can be explored. And uh, yeah, that's absolutely true as well. Um, one of the real advantages of having hardware, you know, English-based design uh, tools is that you can try a number of different approaches uh, at a very high level with very little effort. And that allows you to um, maybe even try some novel solutions that, that might not have been thought of before, uh, as opposed to... Um, if you did this with standard tools, uh, you before you could uh, simulate these things and see if they were any chance they were even going to work, you would have to you'd actually have to probably build hardware. So, uh, I mean, it's just crazy to think um, how powerful these tools really are. So, as synthesizers improve, designs in HDL can be done at higher levels of abstraction. Yeah. So, some of the limitations now are just how powerful the synthesizers are. To, uh, to implement these, these higher level um, abstractions. And if you, um, as they get better and better, then the synthesizer is gonna do more of the work. So for instance, if you write an equation, uh, you know, S equals uh, A plus B, and say you wanna do it with, you know, four bit vectors, eight bit vectors, 32 bit vectors, 64 bit vectors, how is the synthesizer actually gonna implement that? Is it going to do a carry ripple adder? Is it going to do, uh, a, a, you know, a, a, a carry uh, propagate uh, or a carry look ahead adder? If it does a carry look ahead adder, how's it going to implement that? Uh, it's probably not going to implement it by doing all 64 bits in carry look ahead manner because, you know, once you get past, you know, 20 or 30 bits, the number of gates involved for each bit becomes just incredible. So, 
obviously there are lots of reasons why uh, you would normally uh, do a carry look ahead at or maybe for groups of four bits or maybe even eight bits. And then you would daisy chain those groups of eight together to get uh, 32 and 64 bits. Or maybe you might, might even do 16 bit groups, but how's the synthesizer gonna handle that? Where is, where is that, you know, how's that, how are those decisions gonna be made? In the synthesizer unless you specify them and as soon as you have to specify them now you have a lot more work you have to do uh, and uh, so taking that workload off of you allows you to uh, instead of having to think about the details of how that adder is going to be done so that it actually is going to be able to to uh, add things in a reasonable amount of time um, that that's that's very significant and uh, that takes a lot of the work out of the design and allows you to, th to concentrate more on the details of the logic uh, in, in, in sort of the big picture than in, I shouldn't say the details, but allows you to, to focus on the big picture of what you want to accomplish rather than the details of exactly how it would be implemented in an efficient and in, in a you know, uh, fast manner. Um, so the ability to simulate a design before it's turned into hardware saves costs. Yeah, that's very important. Um, HDLs allow a designer to focus more on the overall architecture instead of low-level details. Yes, new HDLs like system variable log and C are under development. Yes, that's all true. Integrated development environments like Vivado contain the following features. They have as associated libraries of third-party or IP that can be added uh, to the design. Yeah, there are lots, lots of uh, available libraries with lots of uh, uh, components that you can just fit in. Uh, <clears throat> maybe uh, an array processor, or maybe a math coprocessor, or maybe uh, things like uh, barrel shifters and, and other nifty devices are readily available. Uh, the, uh, the simulation can be done only after the synthesize, synthesizer has completed. No, you could do pre-synthesize uh, pre-synthesis simulation. And normally you do both pre and post synthesis simulation. You can see where the router and placer put your design in the FPA. Yeah, you have limited visibility into that, uh, but you can get some idea. Syntax checking is a built-in feature of the editor. Yes, uh, the editor in Vivado does check your syntax real time, which is kind of nice. Vivado can generate all the photo masks in, to make an integrated circuit. Nope, Vivado can't do that. Uh, but programs like uh, Mentor Graphics, Cadence, um, uh, uh, several of those uh, can do that. Um, let's see. So the following statements are about hardware design. Mark the ones that are in general true. Very complex ICs are rarely created without using prior IP. I think that's pretty much true. Uh, most of the time, they're going to stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before, and they're going to take advantage of things that have already been done rather than have to reinvent the, uh, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, HDLs were first used to make integrated circuits and later adopted to do simulation. Uh, no, actually, it was the other way around. Uh, these tools were actually initially, the, the, the VHDL was the first one, really, and VHDL was initially created to document software. It was never, it was never intended to uh, simulate already even or, or to actually um, si uh, synthesize stuff. So um, so there definitely was um, uh, it definitely just evolved. And then eventually after a while they discovered, oh yeah, we can we can not only use this to document our software, but uh, but it's detailed enough we can we can actually simulate the software. And then they then they realize as uh, people uh, began to write these uh, very complex synthesizers that you could in fact uh, take these these you could take these English language statements and actually turn them into the tools that you needed to make an integrated circuit uh, for the big systems like Cadence and uh, um, Mentor Graphics and uh, I forget the other big one um, but anyway they uh, that they actually uh, were able to, to write synthesizers that could generate all the photo masks and uh, all the steps that were required 
to manufacture these integrated circuits. Now, obviously, these synthesizers are very process dependent. So it depends on whether you're, you know, what size, what feature size you're using, whether you're using 150 nanometer technology or 28 nanometer or 8 nanometer or 10 nanometer technology. Depends on, uh, on whether you're doing uh, the 3D stuff, or whether you're just doing, uh, uh, whether you're doing everything in, in sort of a planar mode. Uh, some of the integrated circuits now are, are actually using uh, the Z dimension to have additional circuits. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, th these, these, uh, these synthesizers are a, a big part of the story. It's pretty where, where the magic is. Um, so um, one of the keys to good design, uh, break into submodules. Uh, that are separate logical parts of the design. Yes, it's really important to, to, uh, to try and break your overall system down into uh, modules. And they, they need to be, they need to hold together with some degree of, uh, of, of functionality. So you don't want to create submodules just to create submodules. You want them to have uh, a, an obvious uh, uh, function that's kind of complete within itself. Um, and something that you can that you can design, like a good example, uh, the 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 details of how to write to the seven segment display. Uh, pretty much, you want to bury all those details in a submodule. So all you have to do is tell the submodule which which uh, LED displays you want to be on and what you want them to show. And depending on how you write it, you could write it so you can only show hex digits. Um, you could also write it like the fourth option for the final project requires, where you could you could actually show, uh, you could actually tell it uh, uh, which individual segments to be on, and it wouldn't necessarily have to represent, you know, a hex digit. It could represent uh, just, you know, some random uh, segment pattern, uh, like that particular game requires. Um, and then obviously another another adaptation would allow you to turn segments on and such, or, or you could have nothing displayed in the display. If you just, if you say wrote the module, so you have to send it the hex digit zero through F, well then how do you, uh, how do you blank the display and how do you turn on and off the decimal point if you want to use that? And uh, so you can see, you can, you can, you can, inf you can uh, give greater and less amounts of uh, power to these submodules and they can be more and more complete in themselves. Uh, and once you get a submodule that's that's uh, very versatile and covers sort of all the options, then you have something that you can use over and over and over again. And uh, and then you never have to go back and rethink about these details. Uh, you also need to document these things and make very clear what what has to go into uh, when you instantiate it. What signals uh, have to be provided. Like for instance, uh, you know, do you have to provide a, a clock? And if so, uh, what about what frequency does that clock need to be for displaying the, the seven segment displays? That clock has to be, a, you know, in the in a few kilohertz range. I mean, it, if it's too fast, then uh, the LEDs can't fully turn on and off, and you'll get streaking. And if it's too slow, you'll get flashing and barber pulling and things like that that look, you know, look kind of strange. So. You do have to have some some parameters on that clock. Um, um, there are several HDLs, including Verilog, VHDL, System Verilog, System C, and others. Uh, if the Verilog syntax is correct, you can guarantee the code will correctly synthesize. No, not at all. You can write you can write code that uh, will not synthesize. Uh, obviously, you know that uh, that uh, if you leave out options in in um, case statements and and uh, uh, if uh, if and if else statements, uh, then you can sometimes uh, have it synthesized in a way that's not what you wanted. Um, you can have a you can create a latch you that was unintended. Um, you can write uh, you can write code that's just uh, that looks like it ought to make sense, but is physically not possible. Um, there. General differences in writing good HDL code versus C++ code are, are, are this next group. So, you should. So when you write C++ code, you're you're normally thinking of uh, 
you know, in, in sort of logical steps, step one, step two, step three. These are very much sequential, sequential um, codes. When you uh, write HDL, you need to remember that everything is happening all the time. Um, now, obviously, always blocks give you give you uh, process statements that uh, that can depend on signals, but uh, but all the continuous assignments are completely active all the time, just like a regular gate would be, and that's very different than uh, say in in a C in C code. That's one of the reasons why you see many FPGAs today incorporate uh, hard coded uh, cores so that the things that lend themselves to sequential steps can be done with a with a you know a a, 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 a core a computer basically and things that then lend themselves to uh, to parallel processing can be done in programmable logic and I, I think we're going to see this just this is clearly uh, the trend for the future we're going we're, we're going to see more and more situations where uh, where we're, we're when we're doing simple embedded design, uh, we're gonna be using a microprocessor that has, in addition to uh, its, its, its uh, CPU core, it's also got programmable logic. Um, even the low end, uh, the mid-level microchip 8-bit products already have this. Um, so I'm doing a design right now with a PIC 16F18877, and it has five uh, or four, four or five uh, configurable logic blocks where you can set up two layers of logic. Uh, you can route pins around uh, external pins and internal pins, and you can do uh, you can put uh, 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 you can put uh, two layers of a few gates uh, in between any 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 inputs and any outputs pretty much you want. Uh, so it gives you the ability to have parallel processing of some things, and then obviously you're this is incorporated into a microprocessor. So you, you still have the ability to do all these sequential steps as well. And the nice thing is this, this, this programmable logic operates in real time at gate level speeds, independent of the processor. So it gives you a lot of power. Um, and big FPGAs almost all have this now. And if they don't have hard coded uh, cores, you can always soft code cores like we did in the uh, uh, SDK labs. Um, all right, so any legal HDL code you can write can be synthesized. Again, no, not true at all. Uh, there's a strong push to be able to write HDL code in something close to standard C++. Yeah, there is a push to do this. Uh, and uh, I, haven't, I haven't played around with these languages yet. They're still kind of maturing. Uh, but, you know, this is going, this is going to be interesting to see this uh, really roll out. Um, it's going to require smarter and smarter synthesizers, um, and it's going to also require designers to sort of understand uh, the implications of where they're doing things uh, in, in programmable logic that's clearly uh, operative all the time versus in a core that's doing things uh, step one, step two, step three. The use of IP is a big saver in development time. Yeah, it really could be. Um, so inertial delays are for synthesis only. No, clearly all the delays are for simulation only. Propagation delays cannot be synthesized. Yeah, that's right. You specify a propagation delay that is going to be used by the sim by your by your simulator. Um, when the when this pr logic is actually the bit file is generated and downloaded into the FPGA, the FPA FPGA is going to behave uh, as the hardware that it is. So just because you specify a certain uh, propagation delay, inertial delay, or transport delay, doesn't in any way uh, change what the, what the hardware is actually going to do. Hardware has a certain capability, and it's going to run at its native speed using its native capabilities. And your, your delays uh, don't have any effect whatsoever on that. Uh, it is what it is, basically. Um, so wait for 10 milliseconds in an always loop can be synthesized. So normally we use these instructions uh, in, in, the simulizer, in, in the simulators, but it is possible to build in delays in synthesizable code. The dollar file operator is not synthesizable. That's right, it's clearly not. It's, it's, 
uh, it's contingent on a simulator running on a desktop or a laptop computer that has a disk drive accessible to it. Obviously, uh, our FPGA doesn't have a built-in disk drive. I mean, you can put you could you could put that capability uh, in concert with uh, an application that had an FPGA in it, but um, but the synthesizer can't make that happen. You'd have to provide that on a printed circuit board independent of what the synthesizer is doing as far as generating a bit file for your chip. Only integer types can undergo manipulation, multiplication and division in Vivado. So, so uh, division is really a problem. There is, there isn't, uh, division can't be directly synthesized. It's, it's a bit of a problem. You have to write, if you're going to do division, except for uh, dividing by powers of two, where you can do it by shifting, you have to basically uh, write your own code or use IP that's already created to do that. But only integer types can, can undergo multiplication, that's right. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a funny question. All right, um, so here's a little code segment. Now, I, I don't know, uh, it's a little hard to do this with the online version. Uh, I, I haven't decided how much of this I'll do, but anyway, so here's a code. So it's, uh, and I think there's a way to turn off this, all these lines. I wonder if I can do that. Uh, well, anyway, this is a comparator. Um, and so it has a parameter called width. And uh, so um, the here, uh, so width equals eight in this statement, but so that's its default value, but uh, obviously it can be changed. Let's see, I wonder if there's somebody that wanted back in. Yeah, I don't know. Can't see. Oh, over here. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Oh yeah, here it is. Guess I should put this down. All right. Um, so anyway, so uh, let me see if I can remember how to turn this off. Let's see. I think it's here. Uh, options. Uh, Okay, so, um, so here we have, uh, so, the, so the modules are um, A, B, A, equal, A, E, Q, B, A, G, T, B, and A, L, T, B. So A equal to B, A greater than B, A less than B. And then we have the width minus one to zero. So the default value is eight. So that would be seven to zero for A and B. So we're using A, eight bit vectors for A and B. And then our output are just bits, uh, A equal to B, A greater than B, A less than B. Obviously they can't all be true. Only one of them can be true. And then we have these registers. Uh, these bits are, uh, are in a register. And then we have an always block at A or B. So these are level signals. If A or B changes and they're eight bit vectors, um, so begin, uh, A equals B, uh, A equals B equals zero, A greater than B equals zero, A less than B equals zero. If A equals B, then the equal is set to one. Else if, if A greater than B, the greater than is equal to one, else the less than is equal to one. And then, and then module. So, so this is the module. Now, this, this is a fairly high level statement. This depends on the synthesizer to, um, to, to basically create an 8-bit comparator. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do 8-bit comparators and it could be fast or slow and there are all sorts of interesting parts to this. All right, but here are the questions. When you instantiate this module, you must specify the parameter width for the module. No, you don't have to. If you don't specify it, it gets the default value. This is a comparator, yep. If you don't specify a value for width, it will equal 8 bits, correct. 
this always block will result in sequential code. Yes. Well, actually, no. It, 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 sorry, that's not true. It, it, will, it will result in combinational code. A comparator is not sequential. A comparator is combinational. Uh, it doesn't have a clock and it just relies on uh, once the inputs are stable, uh, after the propagation delay, the output should be stable and won't change until you change the inputs. Uh, so it's not a state machine. Uh, this, uh, if you instantiate this same module twice, you could use a different size for width each time. Yes, that's correct. Look at this instantiation and then uh, comparator pound 16, the, uh, the instantiation unique name, the SR1, and then the signals X, Y, EG equal greater or less than EGL. Mark the correct equivalent description of the variable A and B that would be used in this module. Okay, so uh, so obviously, uh, let's see, do we have, yeah, same thing. So in this module, we have, uh, we have these variables. Uh, so, so since it's, we specified width to be 16, that the designation here for the input for A and B would be width minus one to zero. So that's gonna be 15 to zero. So we're looking for 15 to zero, there's only one. So that's the right answer. This code segment will be used for several questions. So here we have uh, the module called first underscore mod, and it has A, B, C, D input. It's got a, a A and B are four bit vectors and C is a five bit output. And uh, uh, it's a, C is a four bit wire and D is a four bit uh, register. So always at A and B. So here's, here's the always block. So it's got level signals again, not edge signals and they're A and B. So it's our four bit vectors A and B. And those are our inputs. Um, so, so pound five A is assigned A plus one and C is assigned A plus one. And then pound five B, B, uh, equals B plus one and D equals B plus one. Now, the first thing you should notice, these assignment statements, these are non-blocking and these with the, just the equal signs are blocking. So now, so this gets a little screwy, but so A changes from two to three, B equals, uh, B equals two is not changed, write the resulting values. So when A changes from two to three, then that's going to trigger the execution of this always block. And uh, so, so A enters the always block as a, with a value of three, B with a value of two. So write the resulting values. Well, so A is three, and now you're going you're gonna to update A immediately with, uh, with three plus one or four. So now A is going to be four. But in the non-blocking here, that's A that's used to assign C is executed simultaneously with this one. So A's value here has not been updated with the new A. So it's still the three, three plus one. So C would be four. So A would be four and C would be four, not five. Uh, if these were blocking statements, then C would have been five. B on the other hand equals two and two plus one is three. So now this B equals three. So this B here, because this is blocking is now updated with three. So three plus one, so D now equals four. So the answer is uh, A is four, C is four, B is three and uh, D is four. All right, A goes to three, uh, A goes from three to four when B uh, goes two to three write the results for A, B, and C. And anyway, so these are, uh, so, well, let's do this one. I, I probably won't put this one in the test because it was very confusing. Uh, students screwed it up a lot, so, uh, but I might ask, I probably will ask at least some question about block and non-blocking. All right, so A goes from three to four and B goes from two to three. Okay, so, so A then enters as four, B enters as three. So again, four plus one. So now this A is gonna be five, but this A still is four. So 
uh, C is going to be five as well, and not six. So A is A is five, C is five. B is three plus one is four, but it's blocking. So now this B is going to be um, is going to be four plus one. So D is going to be five. All right, thirty six. A equals zero. Doctor Morton, could I can I interject and ask a question real quick on that? You bet. All right, so um, the blocking. So if the question is <clears throat> from A to C. So which one are you asking about? Yeah, the G, number G. So if it asks, the, the, if the procedural is, the statements in the procedural block for A and C are blocking, right? No, they're non, they're, those they're are non-blocking. Non-blocking, okay. Yeah. And the other side is blocking. Okay, yeah. got it. Right. I was just, I got them mixed up in my head. Yeah, these these are what you normally want to use in a, in a procedural block with uh, edge signals. If you have level signals, then generally you probably want to use these. Okay. Because Why? one's going to generally turn into combinational logic and one's generally going to turn into really sequential logic. Right. But there are exceptions to that. And I, I had to use some non-blockings when I uh, did, did some of the project stuff uh, because it just didn't work without doing it that way. Yeah, which is, uh, are you talking about like the snake where you add the, keep adding at the back or the front? Uh, so I didn't, I, I didn't do, I haven't done, uh, I haven't, uh, played very much with the uh, snake code. Uh, no. but when I did, uh, when I did the, the gas routines, uh, the games, uh, I definitely, uh, had to use some, some blocking in, even though it, they, they were in, uh, what I, what, what was clearly, uh, procedural, um, going to result in procedural code. Thank you. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you want to keep that straight. So these are the non-blocking, these are the blocking. Okay, and let's see. So A equals zero is not changed and B goes from three to four. Okay, so 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 then A is gonna be updated to one, C is gonna be updated to one, and but B will be five and D will be six. The, co the code has an error for which variable. So uh, that was that was kind of confusing. Uh, and I'm not even sure what the answer to the question, what I even intended when I wrote that. Uh, but obviously B and D, uh, oh, well, okay, here's a, here's the deal. Yeah, so B, B changes, but if, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking, so. Yeah, I don't know. Not sure what I meant with that question. Answer the questions uh, about the hardware on the Nexus 4 board to be used in the lab. The pins on the FBA, FPGA, it's a BGA package. Yeah, they are BGA pins. They're little solder balls on the bottom side of the chip. You can't see them. Uh, the only way to check to see if it's properly soldered is to do an x-ray and uh, or to do some kind of testing. The constraint file specifies whether a pin is an input or an output. Yeah, this constraint file does not specify that. The, the, uh, the determination of whether a pin is an input or an output is in, the, um, is in the port list in the top level module, which is, I don't know, I found that real surprising. The drawing below, what would the pin read when the button is pressed? All right, so let's look at this. So we have an FPGA pin here. We assume that it's set up as an input in the port list uh, and 1.8 volt logic. It's, it's grounded through a resistor. The button's normally open. So when the button is pushed, it pulls it up to 1.8. But when the button is not pushed, then it's pulled down to ground. So what would it read when the button is pushed? It should read a one. You should consider debouncing this input. Um, yeah, well, it depends on how you're using it. But the input might very well uh, might very well bounce. So if you're going to have it in a high speed circuit that could read it a bunch of times in a few uh, microseconds or, millis or in a millisecond or two, then yeah, you probably should uh, probably should debounce it. But you can also 
in software debounce it as well. So, or out. And of course, you're writing hardware anyway. So, and a lot of times the way you'll do that is just is just uh, have it read with a clock, and the clock is slow enough that uh, it's going to ignore the bounces. Uh, or you could also have it set a flip flop, and then not allow the flip flop to change value until the next clock. Um, you would not need to set any internal pull ups or pull downs. No, you don't need internal pull ups or pull downs with this arrangement. If you didn't have this pull down here to ground, you could put an internal pull down. Now, I will say this, generally speaking, because, uh, because getting moderate value resistances in, in your uh, synthesis yeah, built into to, uh, an integrated circuit can be tricky. Um, a lot of times the pull-ups are very high value and they don't and they're not very fast. So that can be a bit of a problem. I know on the pick, it, it has weak pull-ups. Uh, the one we used in micro one, and they're so weak that that they don't really work to uh, to pull a pin up to give you a one uh, and then use and then ground it with a push button. Uh, that that circuit will not work correctly. Uh, so they're not they're not useful for that. They're really only useful for uh, if you have non-terminated pins uh, set as inputs, then having the, the weak internal pull-ups turned on is helpful to keep them from floating around and causing, uh, causing uh, current surges and problems uh, inside the pick. Um, so that's really their only use. Um, <clears throat> if the resistor to ground were missing, what would the pin read when the button is pressed? Well, the button would still read high when pressed. But uh, the problem comes in when the button is not pressed and it's floating, and then you don't know. We we actually did this experiment accidentally when we used the uh, the old Spartan boards uh, because uh, it specifically told us for the buttons we had to turn on the pull-ups, but we didn't do that. And uh, you could you could be reaching toward the button to push it, and it would switch as you reached for the button. Uh, because you were inducing uh, electrostatically a charge on the on the pin, and so it would change it from a zero to a one. Uh, you could also have it go the other direction. Uh, so it was it, it gave us very erratic behavior, and it was quite distracting until we figured out what 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 we had done wrong. So so yes, these these pins, if left floating, will definitely give you funny results if they're connect if you bring your hand close to the to the chip. You can you can induce uh, electrostatically uh, either a one or a zero it depends on the how your hand is charged. Um, didn't that happen, uh, Dr. Moore? Didn't that happen on our uh, remember micro uh, micro one the board that we had there? That happened to me a couple of times where I'd reach for that, and then I'd accidentally touch the uh, one of the pin the sockets or something, and it would yeah. do something odd. Yeah, yeah, it, the same thing is true on a micro. Anytime you have a floating input, it's it's. Though, remember the the impedance on these the input impedance on these pins is really high. Very little current has to flow to change the value, and uh, and it's well within the range of what you can induce electrostatically. So uh, so not to terminate inputs is uh, you know especially when you're trying to use them. Uh, with a pull up or a pull down, depending on how you have them set up, is a big mistake. And like I said, you can you can use the internal pull ups, and they may they may help you with that a little bit, but they're they're not sufficient to make the thing work correctly. Uh, at least on the pick, they're they're too weak. I, on some parts, they're stronger, and they they I think they do work. But boy, they sure didn't on the pick. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, if the button fails to open. The circuit would be stuck at one. Yeah, that's right. If the switch fails, then it would be stuck at one. When you design, <coughs> when you design with a Xilinx FPGA, um, check the provision you need to make on the printed circuit board that will allow that will mount the FPGA to allow it to function when you turn it on. So, a couple of things. One, the chip can run on a wide range of VDD supply voltages. No, that's not true. These chips are pretty sensitive and. And uh, the chip has to run. I think the chip runs. Uh, I think I, I don't even know if the chip runs on 1.8 volts. It, it may actually run lower than that. Uh, 
The circuit will not work for a short period of time after power up. Yeah, that's right. Why is that? Somebody tell me. I'm sorry, what was the question again? The circuit will not work for a short period of time after power up. Why is that? What's going on there? It's true for all the Xilinx parts. Because it needs to configure itself. Well, it has to, you have to read in the bit file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it has to be configured, but it, it, yeah, you have to write, you have to write the bit file in from someplace because it, it's in random access memory, which is volatile and it goes away when it's powered down. So when you power it up, you have to provide some mechanism for putting that bit file back where, uh, back in the RAM. And, uh, that's one of that's one I think of that you know that's a that's an issue with Xilinx FPGAs. Uh, you have to provide that, and there's lots of ways to do it, and they make it as easy as possible. The chip has built-in things that allow you to you know that makes it easier. It has it has you know it has all sorts CPU of CPU reset. What's that? No, it has reset. a couple of buttons that that wipe it too. The reset won't hurt. No, the um... One label program, program. Yeah, program, program, right? So on the board, these are external buttons and, and program the, yeah. So the, the, so there's actually a whole bunch of different ways. You can, you can uh, on, on our board, there's actually, a, there's actually a EE prom on the board or maybe it's flash, I don't even know, but, but you can, you can write your file to the, the on on board memory it's not on chip memory it's on board and then that on board if you, if you have the jumper set up correctly will automatically program the fpga when you power up the the, the board uh, th that's how it shifts when you first get a brand new board it has this fancy little power up routine that includes a vga output actually uh, so so that yeah so that's that is in fact available uh, there's a, uh, and then you can, then you can, you can uh, program it with an, uh, an SD card. You can actually, uh, instead of program, putting a cable and connecting it to a desktop, you can actually power it with a little power cord and you can uh, program it with a USB stick with a jump drive. But regardless of the push, bu push buttons on the board though, when, when you hit <clears throat> program hardware, it should override all that, right? Well, so let's say you have something programmed on the board and you, and like I've been messing with it and then they hit the program button to clear it, you know, thinking that in my mind, like you said, it's not on the chip itself or whatnot, but when you program it, it would, it should override whatever's on the board, correct? When you when you have it connected with a USB cable and you're running Vivado on your desktop or laptop and you program it there, yes, that will, that will, that will, that will rewrite to the FPGA a bit file that puts your code on it. Yeah. But if you have if you have stored on the board uh, the original configuration program, then you unplug the board, power it down and power back up, it's going to get loaded with that program and not the one you just wrote. The one you wrote does not get automatically saved anywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, OK. Generally, you will want to use uh, the internal clock module to save money. It doesn't really have an internal clock module. What it does have, uh, you you provide it with a clock, and then it can it, it can use that clock in different ways. The clock on our board comes from a clock chip that has a built-in crystal and generates a pretty accurate 100 kilo uh, 100 megahertz uh, square wave, and that's what the board gets. And then it can use that to generate other clocks. By, bypass ca caps are required. Yeah, there's all sorts of requirements. There, it has 320, uh, 325 pins or 324 pins, I forget. And it's gonna, it's, it, it, there's also uh, there, a bunch of those pins are power pins and they definitely require uh, capacitors and other, you know, other stuff to make it work correctly. Yeah. All right, let's see, just about done here. Um, so consider the following. Um, okay, so here's an always block. We have uh, S1, S0, I, I0, I1, I2, I3. So if you look at this, you're kind of thinking multiplexer. 
Um, we don't have our external port list or anything. This is just an always block. So it, it's just a little piece of code. And then, and then we have an if statement, if S1 begin, if S0 out is I3, else out I2, uh, and then that's end, else begin, if S0 out I1, else I0. Uh, so, um, so, so in this first one, S1 would be one. And so that then you get uh, I, I3 and I2 based on I0. Uh, here, S1 would be zero, and then you get I1 and I0 based on S0. So what results will be encountered with this code? Okay, it'll create a four to one mux. It will generate a compiler warning. It could, it will create a latch. Okay, what do you think? Do we, do we have, do we have, uh, have we left some, some options? Uh, have we, are there things that are, is it completely specified or are there some unspecified outcomes that- it should create a latch, right? No, I think it should be fine. Oh. Yeah, all our, all our options are covered here. Uh, the always block will result in combinational code. What's the answer to that? Yes, that should be combinational code. Yeah, it should be. Uh, so, so output will be a net after synthesis. It, of course, it has to be defined as a register. So, what do you think? Will it be will it be a register or will it be a, a net after synthesis? Net. Yeah, it should be a net. An unintended latch will be generated. No, that shouldn't happen with this code. It's it's it should be good. The same resulting code can be generated with the question mark operator or with a logic expression. Yes, that's true. You can use a case statement, or you don't even have to use the always block, and you can use the question colon operator. Okay, look at these lines of code. Um, so time, tick time scale, one nanosecond slash 10 picoseconds. Assign pound five A equals B. Assign C equals pound five B. Assign pound five D equals pound five B. So first off, uh, well, line, line two shows an inertial delay. Is that true or false? False. No, it, no it, it does. It shows an inertial delay. What, what would be the delay? Five, five nanoseconds. Oh, uh, five. Uh, okay. A and C will be updated at the same time if B changes permanently from zero to one. What do you think? Uh, yes. That's correct. The signal B was initially zero for one, and it was initially zero, then one for 500 picoseconds, and then back to zero. A does not change, true or false? True. That's right, A doesn't change. The signal B was initially zero and then one for 500 p seconds and then back to zero. C does not change, true or false? False. False. That's right. Because it's a transport delay, the spike, the, the glitch is propagated. A two input NAND gate and OR gate inputs are zero X as the two inputs. What is the output of the NAND gate? One, zero, X can't specify. X? Well, so if you put a zero into an AND gate and, and an X. Zero and X. 
what are you guaranteed to get out? So you're putting a zero in. If you put a zero into an AND gate, what and no matter what you put into all the other inputs, you're going to get a zero. And then if you invert that, you're going to get. You're going to get a one. That's right. So the output is a one. What is the output of the R gate? X. That's right. Write, write the code. For, uh, we're not going to do that. OK. Well, I think we'll quit with that. So um, it'll be something like these questions converted into an online test. So can can that just be our test right now? Because uh, you know I'm such I'm so good at taking tests, Dr. Moore. Well, sorry. <laughs> just joking. Yeah, be fine. Hell, I don't like tests any more than you do. I have to write them <laughs> and then grade them. Real pain. <clears throat> uh, you're going to be on at noon, right? I have some VGA output questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got to do logic design at eleven, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll do the, I'll just stay on it noon. All right. All right. Thanks, Doctor Morton. You I'll bet. You okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye, Doctor Morton. Have a good day. All right. You bet. Let me unshare and close this.